river rest upon the lonely. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd. And please be seated. On your way in this morning, we were handing out cups for communion. If you would like to participate but did not receive a cup, please raise your hand and our ushers will make sure that you get one. We've got one down here in front who would like a cup. On the day Jesus Christ was born, the old covenant was in place. 
what the old covenant was is that once a year a lamb was sacrificed the blood was taken inside the holy of holies and sprinkled across the ark that was in place the day jesus was born the night before jesus died he gathered his friends around the disciples and over dinner with his disciples jesus established a new covenant under the new covenant we believers are royal priests we are more than conquerors we sing songs and we're happy about it and we live in that victory and as he was establishing that new covenant with dinner with his friends Jesus said as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me he did not say how often to do it here at Christ Community Church we choose the first Sunday of each month that we will participate in celebrate partake in communion as remembrance so roughly speaking 29 days a year we live as royal priests 29 I'm sorry 20 29 days a month we live as royal priests 29 days a month we live as more than conquerors one day a month as often as we do this we remember the cost of the new covenant and what was the cost of the new covenant there have been films made many descriptions of the pain of Jesus's crucifixion many of us know those stories we won't go into those right now we'll go into one element of the cost of the new covenant Jesus for the first time and only time in his existence in his life felt guilt imagine a scene Satan the accuser saying well what about talking to God well, what about the time that Troy lied what about the time that so-and-so did X what about the time that so-and-so did Y and God the Father the judge is saying yes you're right guilty and Jesus will pay for it and then Satan says again well what about the time that Bob did so-and-so what about the time that Gene did so-and-so and God the Father says yes you're right that was sin and they're guilty and Jesus will pay for it so then when all of history is all of history's sins is piled on Jesus Christ God his Holy Father the judge who cannot be in the presence of sin left Jesus so we know very we know much more about the cost of the new covenant physically what that cost him in his beatings and the crucifixion think of the cost of the new covenant Jesus being separated from his father feeling not just guilty for the first time and only time in his existence but the guilt of all of history at one moment in time the cost of the new covenant so 29 days out of a month we live as royal priests we live as more than conquerors one day a month we come back and we remember the cost of the new covenant so if you would please take the bread Matthew 26 26 and while they were eating Jesus took the bread and gave it to them and said take and eat it this is my body and then he took the cup and passed it around and said take and drink all of you this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins
Ladies and gentlemen, the price of the new covenant is Christ's blood. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you. We are born with sin in our hearts in a state that cannot even approach you. And yet somehow you loved us enough that you gave us your son. And we thank you for sacrificing your son so that we could be restored to you. May we glorify your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. that was paid for my sin, it breaks my heart. But when I really meditate on it and think about it, it also fills me with an overwhelming sense of joy that that price was paid, that we have a God that is that good. And so I'd ask you to meditate on that, think on that, and share some of that to everybody else that's here today. Shake their hands, give them a high five, give them a hug, and try to extend that as you go on out in today's week. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. The Lord is good, ain't he? <laughs> Isn't he? <laughs> ain't. That's slang, country slang, right? <laughs> but God knows our hearts and our minds. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's all about him. It is all about him. It's always been about him, and it will always be about him. It reminds me of the old song that says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Amen. Thanks for the blood of Jesus Christ who washes away our sins. Amen. If the ushers will come today, we're going to receive today's tithes and offerings. This will also include any step by faith offering that you have for the building plan. If you have an offering for step of faith, this is for the building. You can include that in this offering also. You can go to the Welcome Center and use the app. You can go online to cccmurphy.com or simply text 84321. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We pray a blessing upon the tithes and offerings that they be used to the furthering of the Holy Gospel of Christ that all those around the world to the four corners of the earth will hear the good news of your love and mercy and grace, that they will pray and receive you as Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. We pray a blessing and an anointing upon Brother Richard McGill, Lord, today as he brings the word to us. Anoint him to speak to our hearts. 
that we would hear and know and understand what you would have us to. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit and your love and mercy and grace. For it is by that that we know you and we are saved. We give you the glory and praise and honor for it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, an extra special welcome. If you would, please fill out the Connect card in your bulletin. You can bring that to the welcome desk where we have a gift for you. We'd love to meet you and welcome you into our church family. Just a few quick announcements and reminders for you. Our midweek schedule for this week will remain the same. Uh, Chosen has our back to school splash blast today. So if you have any kids attending that, they do need to be in dark clothing, tops and bottoms in order to get wet and participate. Then we are also in the middle of our 14-day fast, not quite the middle, but our prayer and sacrifice. Um, also, pastors reminding us to just take a break in the middle of the day and to be praying for our nation, praying for our youth, and praying for those uh, things that are deep upon your heart. Then also on August 24th is going to be our men's breakfast. So sign up for that is in the lobby. Men, we're moving it uh, this month to the last Saturday instead of the first Saturday. So we will be meeting on the 24th. Then just another reminder, sight and sound sign up that is due in September. So if you are considering going out to the miracle of Christmas, please make sure that you do get signed up. And then one final reminder, we are starting our discipleship class forward this Sunday. Um, so if you are interested next Sunday, it starts at 9 a.m. and then you can attend the second service. But we love you. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you would, please welcome Mr. McGill. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, Troy was saying during communion, he was pointing out how something changed when Christ introduced the new covenant. Our identities changed. Who we were forever and irrevocably was different at that moment in time. Our identities changed. Who's Rahab? Oh, come on. You guys know who Rahab is. What's the Bible call her? Rahab the... You got it. Rahab the harlot. That was her identity. Did she always have that identity? No. Why does the Bible tag that onto her? Why does Paul, when he refers to her, refer to her as Rahab the harlot? I think that's in there so we will understand that there is no depth that we can sink to, that God cannot redeem us, that he cannot change us, that he cannot make us something different, something more than we were before we had an encounter with him. If you've got your Bibles this morning, you want to look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 3, or excuse me, verses 2 and 3, and it says it beautifully, Beloved, we are God's children now. That's present tense. That's a present reality. And what will be has not yet appeared. So we're waiting for this, for this in the future, for its fullness. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies, present tense, purifies himself as he is pure. What's it saying? It's saying we're somebody different. We are different. We are different because we have had an encounter with Christ. Now this text that I, I picked this morning, I'm, I'm really going to go into Genesis. I'm going to talk about Genesis chapter 12, 25 through Genesis 32. I'm only going to read those, those excerpts. I'm not going to have them put it up on the screen this morning because there's just too much to cover. So if you got I want to make notes, you want to make note that, that this covers Genesis chapter 25 through, through chapter 32. And I'm going to talk about Jacob this morning. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about Jacob's uh, 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 upbringing, Jacob's sojourning, and Jacob's homecoming. Let's start with the upbringing. Now, Isaac was the father of Jacob. 
But Isaac was the son of whom? Abraham. So this goes back to the very foundations of, of the patriarchal Amen. structure that, that we have. So Isaac was 40 years old, and he fell in love, and he married Rebekah. Do you remember that story? Yes. And so they were married for over 20 years, and Rebekah had not been able to bear children. Amen. And she had given her handmaid and she'd given her servant to Isaac to, to, to be able to provide children through that route, but she still yearned in her heart for children. And so Isaac one day prays and he asks God, give her children. Amen. And she conceives. And as she's carrying this baby, as she's going through experiencing this pregnancy, something begins to happen within her. There is jostling, and there is jumping, and there is movement, and there are things going on, and she thinks this can't be right. So she goes and she inquires of the Lord to find out what is happening inside of her. And then Genesis chapter 25, verse 23 says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb and two peoples within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Isaac was 60 years old when this happened. Esau was the firstborn, and as his name implies, his name means red, and as Esau was the firstborn, as he came out, they noticed that he was red, and he was covered from head to toe with what? Do you remember? Hair, he was very, very hairy. And as he emerges, there grasping his heel was the hand of Jacob. And so the, why did they name Jacob Jacob? Because Jacob in its purest etymology means God will protect. But in Hebrew, it sounds very much like heel grabber. And so here was a name to, to kind of depict him. What was his identity? His identity was Jacob. That's how people knew him, as heel grabber. And he did not disappoint as he, as he grew older. Esau grew up, and he became a, a great outdoorsman. He liked to go down and buy his clothes at, at, at uh, Rule King. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, he picked out his clothes over at Dillard's because he just liked the little finer things. Amen. Jacob liked keeping his hands clean. Esau liked hunting and doing things outside. He, he was a, 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 a man afield. Esau was more of a homebody. Jacob was loved by his mother, and Esau was loved by his father. Now, let me tell you something, if you don't already know that. As parents, we need to be careful that we just don't pick out a favorite. That we find one, and this is my beloved child, and I love this child, and all the other kids are nuisances. Because this leads to trouble. This leads to discord. And in this family, this also led to discord. So anyway, in the course of time, Jacob was out hunting and he came in and he was famished and, and Esau had been preparing. I think he might have even just been waiting in expectation for this moment. We come to Genesis 25, or verse 31, and it says, Jacob says, sell me your birthright now. And Esau says, I'm about to die. What use is my birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear it to me now. So he swore it and he sold to Jacob his birthright. He was hungry. He was famished. And Jacob took advantage of the weakness of the moment in order to leverage from his brother the birthright. What is the birthright? The birthright in this society gave the firstborn a double inheritance. So it meant whenever Isaac died that Esau would have inherited twice as much as Jacob. But Jacob, because of his opportunity here, 
has now purchased this birthright from his brother, so he will now inherit twice as much of, of Jacob's belongings. Sometime later, when Isaac had grown on and he could no longer see, he wanted to pass on the patriarchal blessing. What is that? The patriarchal blessing says, you're the guy who is in charge of this family. You bear the name, you bear the responsibility for overseeing and basically being the authority over the rest of the siblings. So it came time. He didn't know how much longer he was going to live. He, he was getting up in years, and he decided that it was time to, 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 to pass this blessing on. Now, now, Isaac lived 180 years, so he lived a good long time. I'm, I'm giving you some hints here for a question that I'm going to ask you in a little bit, too. So he called Esau, and he told him, he says, I want you to go hunting. I want you to bring back some of my favorite game, and I want you to prepare it the way I love it, because today I'm going to give you the blessing as my firstborn son. Well, Rebecca hears, hears this. And Rebecca, who favored whom? Jacob decided that, hey, you know what? We can circumvent this deal. Here's what I want you to do, Jacob. I want you, instead of going out to the field and hunting, looking for a wild game, I want you to go over here to the goat pen and bring me back two young goats. And we're going to slaughter those goats, and I will prepare them. I know how he likes, what the way he likes his food. I will prepare them. And while I'm doing that, I want you to go over to Esau's tent, and I want you to find him his best clothing, his best raiment. I want you to put that on. Well, Jacob says, but he'll know it's not me. He, I'm not hairy like my brother. And so Rebecca has a plan for that. They took the goat skin and they placed goat skin on his neck and they placed goat skin on his arms and they placed goat skin on his hands. Have you ever felt the hair of a goat? Have you ever I mean, this guy must have been something. I mean, this, this, this was a little bit gross in my opinion. But anyway, here he was in his brother's clothes, disguised in a way that he could deceive his blind, elderly, dying father in order to get from his father the blessing that his father intended for his older brother. That's messed up. Would you not agree? That's messed up. Amen. Amen. So, where are we at? So, Rachel prepares this meal. She gives it to Jacob. She says, take it in to, to your father. And so, here we go. Genesis 27, verses 18 through 27. And so, he went into his father, and he said, my father... And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. That's a lie. I have done as you have told me. Now sit up and eat my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord has granted me success. Amen. That's a lie. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near me that I might feel you, my son, and know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau hands. So he blessed him and said, are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Then he said, this is, this is Isaac, bring it near me that I might eat some of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, come near me and kiss me, my son. So he came near him and kissed him and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments. Oh, the fragrance of his brother was on his clothes. 
messed up family. So Jacob, not Esau, received the blessing of the firstborn. Now, here's the question that I, I was giving you little hints for. How old do you think Jacob was when he did this? Just shout out a number. How old do you think he was? Pardon? 17. Do I have a higher number? We'll bid this off like an auction. Anybody? Do I hear 18? Anybody say 18? 20. Anybody got a highest number? Let's go to the, to the biggest number. What's the biggest number? Huh? 30. 30. He was 76 years old. He was 76 years old when he decided it was time to deceive his father and cheat his brother out of what was in, originally intended for him. Now that's messed up. That is pretty much messed up. I understand why you would think he was 16 or 17 years old because he might have lacked the maturity to understand fully what it was he was doing. But he knew. He knew what he was doing. 76 years old. Esau is furious. He is so angry. This little runt has done this to me again. And he goes to his dad and he says, is there not a blessing left for me? And his blessing was not too much of a blessing. He told him basically what the consequences was of the blessing that he had given to Jacob that he was going to serve him. But he also says there will be a day that comes that you'll throw off his yoke from around your neck. So here we have the situation. Genesis 27, 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Amen. So the situation starts turning quite grave here. When Rebekah realizes just how angry Esau was, she devised the plan for, for Jacob to get away. Rebekah goes in and convinces Isaac that Jacob doesn't need to, to marry a Hittite girl. He, do, he doesn't need to marry one of the local girls. He needs to go back to her brother's clan and pick him a wife out of his brother's family. Yes, they married cousins back then. So, he, you know, he, he's supposed to go back to, to his weird uncle Laban. Now, we all have weird uncles, do we not? I mean, we have, most of us have strange uncles in, in our family, un, these unusual characters. And Laban, I think, as far as weird uncles go, might just take the cake. So, where am I at? I am transferring from his raising to his sojourning. He heads out on his way to his to weird Uncle Laban's house. And on the way, he's, he, he's sleeping. He, he, he camps for the night. And something wonderful happens. Something that I think that there, an encounter that would make a difference in your or my life. Amen. And it's interesting how he responds to it. Genesis chapter 28, verses 11 through 15 says, When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with his top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, our grandfather Abraham, and, and the God of Isaac. I will give you your descendants, the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. 
all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Have you heard that before? Have you heard it? Who, how, when, where did you hear it? Abraham. Abraham. And it was also given to, to Isaac. And now it's being conveyed to Jacob. Oh, this is a moment of significance. But you know, we can't easily shake off our identity. And Jacob, in this moment, he recognizes that he is in the very presence of God, that God is in this place. So he rises up and he names the place Bethel, Bethel because he's saying God is here. He takes the stone and he raises the stone on which he slept. He raises it up vertically. He anoints it with oil because he wants to show reverence to the fact that he's there in the presence of God. And then he makes this vow. And I want you to listen closely to the words of the vow. Then Jacob made a vow. This is Genesis 28 verses 20 through 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord, then, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. All of you that, oh, excuse me, all and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. What's he saying? He's saying, you're not my God yet. You may have been grandpa's God. You may have been dad's God. But you're really not my God. But I'm willing to give you an addition here. I'm willing to give you a trial run. If, if you do this and this and this and that, then I will give you a tip. I will give you a tenth. Is that not what he's saying? He has not come to the realization of who he is or really who he is dealing with. <clears throat> Jacob desires success. He desires prosperity. He desires recognition. He wants to be the leader of his family. He wants to find favor and the blessing of God on his life. But he chooses to stick with the same old strategy of scheming, conniving, lying, deceiving, and manipulation. We need to check our lives on occasion. We need to check the language that we use when we're addressing God. Amen. Do we see him as God? Or do we see him as a means to an end? When Jacob finally arises or arrives at, at that, that crazy Uncle Laban's house, he soon discovers that this whole cheating, scheming, conniving, deceiving, lying, did I already say lying? Lying pathway is not something new to the family. Old Laban, who's done this for a few years himself, is pretty good at it. And so it doesn't take long for Jacob to discover that the deceiver can be deceived, Amen. that the cheater can be cheated, that the conniver can be out connived, if that's, if that's such a thing. Genesis 29. Now, I'm going to jump around here a little bit, so, so I'm not going to give you a sp particular verse. Then Laban says to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, you should therefore, sir, you should, should you, excuse me, should you therefore serve me for nothing? So he's, he's saying, hey, 
you know, I've been ha helping out around here, but, but, but maybe it's time that you drew a little bit of a salary for what you're doing. Sounds good, right? I'm going to pay you. <clears throat> Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now we get into the thick of it. Now Nabon had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. That's a dangerous combination. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your youngest daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man, so stay with me. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. It's time to get married. He's been there seven years. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place, and he made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter, Leah, and brought her to Jacob. And when he went into her, Oh, excuse me, and he went into her, and in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the older. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Complete the week of this one, that's the honeymoon week, and we will give you the other one also in return for serving another seven years. Jacob did so. He completed the week. Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife, and so Jacob went unto Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. He extended his contract. There's familiar tones here. There's deceit taking place in a tent. There's deceit taking place involving someone who's having difficulty seeing. Does it not sound familiar? What do you think old Jacob thought when he found out that he had been outmaneuvered on this situation? Jacob stays with Laban another 20 years, or a total of 20 years. Jacob and Laban go round and round with each other and each one out trying to out connive and out scheme the other one But God has a plan for Jacob And even through his conniving and even through his scheming and his manipulation God continues to bless him and he begins to grow in wealth Amen. and in stature and finally it comes to a point to where Laban's just no longer comfortable having this guy around because he's taken all the best of my property. He's got my daughters. He's got the, the most healthy of the livestock. He's got large numbers of animals and camels and donkeys and servants and children and all these things are happening and going on. And he just decides this isn't good. So the Lord intervenes here. And then the Lord, Genesis chapter 31, verses 3, says, The Lord, then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So God gives him the summons that it's now time to go home. So how old do you think he is at this point? Close to 90. 97 years old. 97 years old. He is no longer a pup. So at the year, uh, age of 97, Jacob returns to, to Canaan, to the land of promise, to the land of the covenant, the covenant-keeping God, and has, has invited him back. The question now in Jacob's mind is how strong is this grudge with Esau? What's Esau going to think when I come back home? What's Esau going to think when I show up with all these camels and all these donkeys and all these sheep and all these goats and all the blessing that God has given me? 
How is he going to respond to that? So he, he comes up with a plan. He says, you know what? I think I will send some servants on ahead to go ahead and announce to, to Esau that I'm coming so I have opportunity to kind of feel out where he is in this thing. So he sends these spies, if, if you will, out to, to converse, and they come back and they say, hey, Esau has decided he's coming to your house. He's coming out here to meet you, and he ain't coming alone. He's coming with 400 men. There is a small army coming his direction, and what's he going to do about it? All his conniving, all his scheming, all his manipulation has brought him to this point, and what's he going to do about it? In his desperation, he goes before God, Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 through 12. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all these deeds of steadfast love and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. For only with my staff I crossed this Jordan River, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He's almost there. He's getting close. He didn't call him his God. He still referred to him as the God of his grandfather and the God of his father. But he reminds him and he shows him that he's mindful of the promises that God has given him. And so he comes up with a plan. Oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pacify my brother. I'm, I'm going to send these gifts over to him. I'm going to send the animal and the livestock over. This was part of a good idea to pacify, but it was also part of a scheme to slow him down. Because when you have animals, if you have cattle and you have calves, you can only travel as fast as the calves can go. So he's slowing him down. And then he takes all of his possessions and he sends them across. And then he takes the servants and he takes his wives and he takes his children and he sends them across. And he stays on the other side of the river so that there is a barrier between he and his brother. And then something amazing happens. At night he discovers there's a stranger in the camp. There is a stranger in the camp. There was someone unaccounted for in the camp. And he begins to wrestle and struggle. Now let me tell you something. He is 97 years old. And he wrestles and he struggles all night long. Amen. How many here have been wrestlers? We used to have to wrestle in high school. I, it was part of PE. I was not that great at it because you know what? It was tough. We would wrestle four or five minute bouts, and let me tell you, they could be some of the most painful and some of the most longest and some of the most stressful four or five minutes that you could ever experience. Amen. All night long, he struggles. Finally, the sun's beginning to rise, and the man, the stranger, the God man, says, let me go. And when he sees that he's not causing Jacob to give up, he reaches and he touches the hollow of his thigh. His hip becomes dislocated. And here he is, exhausted, worried, desperate. And he does the one thing that he should have been doing all along. He kept struggling and fighting and resisting God, and he started cleaving to him. He started holding to him. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. 
I'm going to hold to you. I'm going to cleave to you. I may not overcome, I'm, but I will, I'm willing to sacrifice my desire. I'm willing to sacrifice my identity. I'm willing to give up who I am and cleave to you because what you have for me is so much better than I can gain on my own. I cannot connive my way to this. I cannot deceive my way through this. I cannot, in my own strength, power my way through this. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm weary, and oh God, I'm holding on to you, and I'm saying, bless me, Lord, bless me. Oh, and that's when it happens. He says, you're no longer going to be called Jacob. You're no longer the heel grabber. You're no longer the supplanter, but you're going to be called Israel. Israel is a unique name. It's, it's, it's kind of undefined in its etymology. It's undefined as which is the subject and which is the object. Israel, in one definition, means God will fight for Jacob. In the other meaning, it's Jacob will fight with God. So here is the man who has struggled to the end of his strength fighting with God. And God gives him this promise. Oh, Jacob, you are now Israel, and I will fight for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my, my. I need to sh shut this down, don't I? Here we go. And God comes through for Jacob because God will strive for Israel. And a miraculous thing happens. Esau arrives and he welcomes his brother with open arms. You see, when he went to meet his brother, he's tired, he's limping, he's wounded, and he knows that he can't fight him. And he knows that all he can do is trust Amen. and believe and cleave to the promises of God. And we have been in that place, have we not? We have been in that place in times in our life when we have wrestled and fought to the very limit of our strength, to the very limit of our abilities. But there comes a time when we have to realize that in our weakness, he is strong. In our weakness, he is made perfect. There was a song that we used to sing as little kids. And I'm sure you all know it. And the words go, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones, to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Oh, if you remember nothing else, remember that you are loved. You are loved. You are loved when this world says that you are worth nothing. Jesus says you are worth dying for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for your word. Help us, God, to understand our identity in you. Help us, Lord, to understand that it's not by our strength, it's not by our might, but it's through your spirit, saith the Lord. Guide us, direct us, use us, grow us, nurture us as your children, and we will cleave to you, God. We will hold to you. We will be mindful of your promises. And, oh, Lord, we find our new identity in you. Thank you, Jesus. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. If there are any that are in need of prayer this morning, please come forward. We'll pray for you. Otherwise, 
you're adjourned.